Greetings. This is Griff Ruby, the Nostalgic Catholic, with my next uh, Asimov short story review. And this story appears in the November 1942 issue of Super Science Stories. Uh, although his name and the story does not appear on the cover, it does appear inside. Um, again, as always, shows up in the table of contents and there it is the imaginary on page 74 imaginary Isaac Asimov 74 and it even has a little publisher's blurb and it says immutable fixed are the laws of growing things here is the story of a man who dared tamper with life forces and created the destroyer of his own race. So, it's called The Imaginary. This would be the last story of his to see print in 1942. And indeed, he had stopped writing um, a whole lot earlier than that, by the beginning of that year, in fact. So that even what we saw in the first part of the year if the foundation installments, the robot story, run around, um, and yes, even time pussy, to say nothing of the various stories that came in the other magazines. In fact, actually, this magazine is a brief mention of him on page 114. It doesn't say very much, but it's kind of interesting to see his name come up in a different place. Page 114. We have a little tiny section called Spotlight on the STF. And it starts right off with Isaac Asimov, long known as science fiction's most eligible bachelor, has finally taken the plunge. By the time you read this, Asimov and Bride will be settled in Philadelphia where he is doing vital chemical research for the war effort. Dot, dot, dot. Um, the rest of the paragraph speaks about other people. So, and I also noted some letters in the back. Readers tend to like the victory unintentional, even if the more official reviewer types didn't seem to think much of it as a story. Apparently, again, it's one of those things that people like to read, but somehow don't see a whole lot of intellectual uh, interest in. So, but it's, it's, it's interesting that, that you know, that seems to be a fairly common reaction with that story. But this is this story, the imaginary, and once again, um, we get a rather curious piece of artwork. Um, you know what? I think I'll discuss the artwork when we get to the point of the story. Here's the thing: you, you've seen sometimes he likes to include a bit of real science or like an analytic geometry or something um, in his stories. In this case, he decides to throw in a little bit about imaginary numbers. You know, or you could really properly say complex numbers. Um, now, I know he was a very smart man and so forth, but I've, I have the distinct impression that he has never fully wrapped his head around just what exactly these imaginary numbers exactly are. Um, is really, I mean, the pure imaginary numbers, you know, the square roots of negative numbers, okay? Minus one, most important. He actually mentions that several times in the story. But it's like, you know, we're talking about that. And it's saying, okay, we've got all this mathematics that can predict behavioral problems. And what did he do? He stepped into the realm of imaginary numbers because this is a continuation of Homo Sol. In fact, chronologically, as sequels go, this one falls directly in between Homo Sol on the one side and the hazing on the other. It was written before the hazing, but the thing was, um, it just took a lot longer for this story to see print because Campbell didn't want it and Fred Pohl didn't want it. And it, went, it made the usual round and nobody seemed to be interested in it. So... Finally, 
uh, Tremaine, a guy named Colin Tremaine, who had been running astounding, well, it was astounding stories before it turned became astounding science fiction, um, before John uh, Campbell took it over, um, he was deciding he'd start up another magazine called Comet Stories. And he was interested in it, and he looked at it, and he thought about it, and he was ready to buy it, in fact. But Comet Stories folded after just a tiny number of issues. Um, and that was the end of that. And so suddenly, the story is back in uh, Asimov's pocket. He didn't know what to do with it, so he kind of retired it for a while. But then the whole super science fiction slash stories... And uh, Astonishing Stories, Enterprise. Um, well, Fred Pohl was no longer in charge of that. Somebody else was, who I guess reached a point where he was ready to pick up anything by Isaac Asimov, even if it meant putting it out under another pseudonym or the weapon by H.B. Ogden, or in this case, the Imaginary, which at least now is under Isaac Asimov's name. But it came out. You know, so much later that the hazing, which was written after it, came out before. But it is the sequel, and the proper sequence, if you want to read the stories as like a little trilogy of stories, like a real series, it, it, it goes like this. You've got Homo Soul, then this, the imaginary, then the hazing. Even as you had the original half-breed followed by the half-breeds on Venus. Or again, you had not final followed with victory unintentional. So those are little two-parters, and this would be like a three-parter. So, and of course, he's got his robot series going, and he's got his foundation series going, and we've seen you know, well, a couple of installments of it earlier this year. But he is so busy now being a married man, married life, a whole series career job that's paying good money, you know, working for the government. And, you know, so he's, he's got a full, busy life. He really just didn't have time to write stories anymore. And he probably might not have expected to write anymore. So, in fact, it won't be until well in 1943. He finally just gets the bug and writes another story. And that'll appear in Astounding, Astonish, Astounding Science Fiction, as will, in fact, all the rest of his stories released throughout the 1940s. But here we are, looking at the imaginary. And basing it on imaginary numbers, as I've said, he's written on many different scientific and even some mathematical subjects. And even though he discusses them or mentions them in passing a few times, I get the distinct impression he was never really comfortable with them. And I guess a lot of people aren't. But, for example, when you're working with uh, you know, electronic quantities and so forth, um, you can have resistance on the real axis. And you could have inductance versus capacitance on the imaginary axis. And this makes possible a number of calculations that are very important to electronics. So imaginary numbers are not really imaginary. Even as you know, irrational numbers you know, are, aren't irrational like the person who's lost their mind. They, are, they just don't have a ratio. You can't, it's, it's this divided by this integer divided by that integer. That's, that's the only thing. You know, but it's easy to picture the square root of 2, and, and even that it would be some number that somehow just does not line up with any of the infinite number of rational numbers there are scattered throughout the number line. And so, just as you can have rational numbers, irrational numbers, um, negative numbers, and y'all understood those perfectly fine, but imaginary is something you really got a good grip on. And in fact, even less do I have I've ever seen it discussed complex numbers, which is what that's really part of, a full self-contained field, because, you know, take, you take integers, integers are not self-contained by addition and subtraction, you know, or, or these positive numbers, integers are not, because you can always subtract a bigger number from a smaller number, and suddenly you're off into the negative numbers, okay, so that's one thing, so now you have to include negative numbers. Likewise, you can't say work with integers because you have, uh, you know, because while they're closed in multiplication, you know, you multiply two integers, you will always get an integer. But you can divide two integers, sometimes you'll get an integer, but sometimes you get a fraction. You see, so there's your rational numbers. 
you know, now you get to the next thing up, you know, exponents and roots. Um, again, you can take any number and you can take an exponent of that number and it'll be whatever kind of category that number is. You know, if it's a rational number, it'll still be a rational number. If it's an integer, it'll still be an integer. If it's an irrational, uh, it'll still be irrational. But, on the other hand, if you uh, take a root, now all of a sudden you can get, not well, roots can, let, can take you from integers and rational numbers to irrational numbers, first of all. And second of all, the moment you take a root of a negative number, now suddenly you're off into the world of the imaginary numbers, as they call them. So, and then that opens up that whole realm of the uh, complex numbers, form A plus BI. A is the real component, B is the imaginary component. And actually, for the pure imaginary number, which would be like 0 plus BI, where B is not 0, that really doesn't appear to have any noticeable or discernible application, I have to admit. I've never found that. But the thing is, all other complex numbers, like the one I just mentioned with the electrical calculations, you, you know, both A and B are non-zero. You're out there on that other part of the field somewhere. And those numbers really do seem to have real connections with reality. And especially when he's talking about these robots of his that have these, you know, like voltage potentials or something like that, I don't see how that wouldn't get into the realm of complex numbers. So, if you were really doing even just the mathematics for a positronic mind, um, so I say nothing of psychohistory, you're going to have all kinds of numbers. In psychology, you could have numbers. So what did the guy do um, in the imaginary? He decided to start using imaginary numbers in his calculations, and suddenly, voila, he could figure out his squid problem that he was always worrying about all through homo soul. He solved that, and then he goes home, visits his wife. There's a cute little whole story with him. He's been away from his wife for two years, he seems to have kind of a cynical attitude about her. Uh, I'm not <laughs> quite sure I understand the relationship. I, it, it's almost like something out of a 1950s, uh, oh, what do you call this, a situation comedy kind of thing. You know, the honeymooners or, you know, I love Lucy kind of a, a marriage. So it's, it's like he wants to really just be on his own, be this master scientist and do all this great stuff. But sometimes she has to go home and, yeah, feed the domestic fires, and uh, he doesn't seem to care for that much, but it's just one of those obligations he's just kind of seemed to inherit it or something. I don't know. But at any rate, there, there it is. He's got the little wifey poo, and she's not responding to mathematics because he's got her all sussed out, mathematically speaking, too. And suddenly she's not responding that way at all, and just totally confusing the heck out of him. And he's, he's worried, what is going on here? He can't calculate. He can't imagine what's going on. No, imaginary again. But at any rate, so you've got these two. He's got that problem. But meanwhile, he's been away from his experiment with the squid, and a couple other people there decide to do their own little experiment, and something goes crazy. And I guess it's thought that well, what would happen if you had the imaginary component by itself, and somehow that took on a reality of some sort. And it's like you get this weird sort of a, oh, kind of a being, not being, that kind of grows, eats up space, kills everything it meets up with, and becomes this growing nightmare. And that is what we're seeing portrayed in the picture here. You've got some of these alien beings, same kind of alien beings as you would have seen in Home of Soul, just a couple of them. And in here is tank there's a squid but something's overgrowing it and growing outside of the tank that kind of captures the idea um, there's a blurb on this page it says immutable fixed are the laws of growing things here's the story of a man who dared to tamper with animal life forces and found he had created the destroyer of his own right so that's almost the same as the one under the uh, under the table of contents entry so his two assistants have created this weird nightmare force field that's kind of like it's alive. It sends out uh, pseudopods and tentacles, and everything it touches dies, and it expands. And now it becomes this gigantic scandal on the university where this was going on. Alturas University, 
Yeah, it's the same one where the, the hazing was going on, or would be going on it in the sequence of the story. So, um, there's a, there's one other tiny variation I found, and I think other than that. They seem to be identical between the text seems to be identical between the original publication and the publication as found in the uh, early Asimov, which is another one of the places where a lot of these early lost stories end up for reasonable reasons. Uh, remember, remember, there were these two characters who uh, decided to play with a squid while he was away. One of them is named Lore Harridan, and the other one well, doesn't matter. For some strange reason, in one place it appears as Thor Herodin. That got fixed. It's Lord Herodin. So, other than that, the texts are identical. You've seen the artwork. And, basically, he now has two problems to solve. One, he needs to come back to the university and find this thing because it's expanding. They had to evacuate the university. Everything that's expanding, whatever it is, touches dies but he puts on a suit of osmium something or rather and he's got wood plated glass and all this kind of stuff to kind of protect him from that field long enough to get into this original aquarium where the squid is and apparently he can just muck around with the ph and that's all it took to cancel the whole thing because you couldn't zap it with a tonite gun ah yes we had the tonite gun gun again you know remember those you know, so uh, that didn't work. Um, I had to try to uh, stop this thing from expanding somehow. He manages to do that, and then he discovers along the way also what had been going on with his wife. She was playing with him. She decided to study psychology, and she was playing with him. So then. You just realize, oh, it's sort of like the problem in cycle history. As long as you don't know what what's going on as far as the cycle of history, beyond just some vague manifest destiny for the foundation to eventually start the Second Galactic Empire, but no specifics, you see, everything proceeds according to the mathematics. If ever first foundationers were to start actually understanding the mathematics, of cycle history and start being able to see and predict what's going to happen you see then they could tamper with that and then things might not come out as predicted you know well it's kind of the same problem here there's mathematics that predicted that his wife would react to us and so for being away for so long um and she didn't but she knew the mathematics that she was studying on the psychology text you know um and she knew how to do that. And so she knew how to play with that in ways that was totally confusing and what is going on here. But um, knowing that, you just had to get to the third power, you know, something or others. And, and it was probably mathematically, it was psychobabble, but you know, tech, kind of a mathematical equivalent to technobabble. But at any rate, all you had to do was kind of this third rate level something equations and then he could again figure out what she's doing and uh, that victory meant more to him than solving the problem with the squid so I don't know as a story I didn't find it all that enjoyable the bit with his wife mildly so the bit with the squid I don't know my feeling was the less said about that the better but it had to be there for comparison purposes. I think he, I think his solution with his wife was better than the solution to the squid anyway. It was just a, you know, one of those techno babble solutions. At any rate, it's not his strongest story. I can see why neither John Campbell or Fred Pohl would take it. But as I said, uh, uh, now no longer Fred Pohl controlled super science stories would take it. It's got Asimov's name on it. So, yeah, as I say, it's not completely empty, but it, it's kind of in the lower reaches of his stories. And that's kind of the end until we will see Death Sentence in late 1943. Well, that's all I have to say. Thanks for listening.